Uh, thanks very much, Gertie. It's fantastic to be here. I was here working with Walter what, three years ago, and to me it feels like that was a year ago or six months ago, but apparently it was three years ago. And it was a phenomenal experience then, and it's again been a phenomenal experience to work with all of you, particularly all of you, on, this, uh, on, this, on Restore. So what I'm going to do quite quickly this morning, because you've got a lot of stuff to do, so I don't want to be the one that holds you up. I'm just going to do a fairly conventional little introduction, talking about some of the things we've been talking about in Restore and some of the backdrop to where the world is at. And you've heard most of it before, so I'm not going to spend much of it time on it. And then I'm going to play three scenarios. And I mean play. I'm going to do a little bit of play acting on these three scenarios just to get you to think about what the world might or might not look like in 2050. And as I know, have absolutely no more idea than you do what the world is going to look like in 2050, they are scenarios. And I just want you to think about them as we get into them. So this is what we've been talking about. Pick your topic. It's, I think they're all there. There's probably some I've missed. And there's some that we haven't probably talked about in great detail. But these are just some of the things we've been talking about over the last uh, four, four and a half days. And if there's anything you should take away, and I think it's been pretty clear from all of the speakers, complexity is what we're dealing with. Complexity and uncertainty. And that's not going to change. That's actually probably going to get more complex and more difficult as we go forward. And having this chance to meet and talk about it and think about these complex problems is a wonderful thing. And hopefully, it inspires you to think more about them and to seek some solutions. This is a book that uh, I just started reading. So it's uh, by Simon Winchester. Simon Winchester is actually a geologist. He's written a number of fantastic books. But this is his I've only just started it. So I expect it's pretty. But I opened the cover, and this was the first quote that was inside the cover. So I'm just going to read you this quote. And the book is about land and ownership of land. And so this, this is a quote Jean-Jacques Rousseau in 1755. And it says, the first person who, having enclosed a plot of land, took it into his head to say, this is mine, and found people simple enough to believe him was the true founder of civil society. What crimes, wars, murders, what miseries and horrors would the human race have been spared had someone pulled up the stakes, filled in the ditch, and cried out to his fellow men, do not listen to this imposter. You are lost if you forget that the fruits of the earth belong to all and the earth to no one. So unfortunately, that didn't happen. So we are where we are, <laughs> and we have to deal with all the problems and situations that result from the fact that uh, that piece of advice from Jean-Jacques uh, Rousseau never came to pass. And over here on your right, this is a picture I took a few weeks ago. Um, this is in Italy, and I just this encapsulates our modern world. To me, here, is, here, here are rocks, and the rocks are obviously very steeply dipping, and we're cut by, of course, an, an unconformity, a very human Anthropocene unconformity. So this is what we have done. Humans have modified our planet, and we're continuing to do so. That's a fact. We can't change that fact. It's how we manage it that's important. So we've talked a little bit about this. People have talked about exponential growth. The last 100 years has been the story of exponential growth, population, and everything else that flows from human population. So energy, bottom right, directly related to energy, CO2, top right, and at least for the major metals, the same, the same story, exponential growth. And exponential growth is a scary thought because you can't have exponential growth forever. So what does this mean? How does this going to work? What is going to change in order us, for us to, re, to at least stall that growth pattern? And then on top of that, we've got the whole, what we've been talking about, climate change and climate change mitigation and the need for technologies, electrification, uh, um, renewable energy, whatever, that are going to deliver a, a lower, less intense world with lower emissions and therefore reduced CO2 for our, for our planet going forward. So these are three charts. This is from an, the International Energy Agency in 2021. And several organizations have played this game. They've tried to estimate how much metal we're going to, going to need. And the only thing you should know about all of these estimates is that they're wrong. They're estimates. So there's lots of assumptions built into them and so on. So they're wrong, but even if they're half right, the story is still pretty scary. So on this plot, these ones, the red line is a sustainable development scenario. So that's to get to two degrees by 2050. And the red lines for copper, lithium, cobalt, go shooting up into space there, suggesting that we need vastly more of those materials. 
The yellow lines are a kind of stated policy. Where we're at now, it's kind of follow the trends. The trends were on to do better now, but it's kind of steady state progress, not dramatic change. And uh, they, even they generate gaps, apparent gaps, and so on. So can we fill these gaps? Well, the answer is possibly yes. It's going to require expansions of existing operations. It's going to require new technology to do a better job of recovering the metals from, the, from our deposits. It's going to take new discoveries. And, you know, we might actually fill these gaps. And so I raise this question, are these real? Are these supply gaps that everybody's talking about, that everybody's getting carried away about, are they real? And I'll just show you this. This is the kind of euphoria that's out there. Particularly this was in end of last year, beginning of this year. You know, 40% increase in copper demand in the next 20, 20 years. And other, others will go higher than that. And so is that possible? Or is the whole energy transition in a stall on the fact that we can't deliver this amount, this amount of metal. So I'm just going to give you a warning on this. In, and this is a story, it's a true story. In 1980, I was a young student, I went to a talk in a room like this, and it was an expert on molybdenum. The market of, of, of molybdenum worked for a company they called Amax that ran Henderson and Climax, the mines that Nicole talked about earlier this week. Back in 1980, these were phenomenal mines producing molybdenum. And this person produced those graphs and show this massive supply gap going forward. He said, this is amazing. We're in the molybdenum business. Molybdenum's vital for pipelines. We're building pipelines everywhere. We're going to need so much molybdenum. We can't supply it. It's going to be fantastic. Two months later, the price of molybdenum crashed through the floor, and it didn't recover for 25 years. I don't know what happened to that poor person, <laughs> but for that lesson has always stuck with me. Treat these, these gaps, these projections into the future with some caution. That's not to say they're wrong. They probably are, at least have some truth in them. But treat them with caution, because we do not and are not able to predict the future. And strange things happen when we try. So that's my warning. And just to emphasize this, this is some work on this diagram from Gavin here in the audience and Simon Jarrett. Yeah, and I have a very tiny little piece of involvement in that. And what, was the, what they've done here, <laughs> what they've done here is to plot on this graph from 1994 to 2018 production. So that's the production increasing in copper, continuously increasing, steady state going up three percent plus or minus on an annual on an annual basis. So if you're doing that, if you continue to produce more and more, surely the amount that we've got, the amount of reserves that we have, is going to decrease. But no, actually, the black line there, the reserves are still increasing. And the production to reserves ratio is pretty, pretty constant on the whole. And the same can be said for many other commodities. So the truth of the matter is that actually we're quite good at replacing reserves. We make discoveries. We fill these gaps. So are those gaps that we predict going out into the future real? Is the amount that we need, the new amount that we need in terms of the energy transition, really going to be so impactful that it's going to limit our supply? Or is our supply not going to be limited by availability of the material, but about all the other issues that we've been talking about this week, the so-called ESG, environment, social governance issues that the industry faces, communities, greenhouse gases, energy, water, waste, land access, availability, competition for land, biodiversity, transparency. Are these are the issues that are actually going to limit the amount of our ability to supply the world with, the, with copper that we need? So this, this is what we've been talking about. This is the big, the big questions that you're here to think about and discuss uh, in the rest of, the, of today. And just a warning again, here's copper. So all of that euphoria on copper, most of it came out at the end of 2021. And the price of copper at the end of 2021 was reaching record highs. That's the top of those graphs. They had over $10,000 per, per, per ton. You know, that, that's unbelievable. The industry said, wow, we're amazing. Not only are we going to have record prices, but we're really good guys because we produce the commodities that the world needs. Clap, 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 clap. Aren't we wonderful? Oops. Well, this is what's happened in the last three months. We've lost 25% of the price of copper because no one predicted, which is kind of amazing, really, but no one predicted that China would do another shutdown. I mean, uh, Really? Did no one predict that China would do another shutdown? They did another shutdown. The China, you know, current economy in China is very slow by Chinese standards. By our standards, it's still quite quick, but by Chinese standards, it's very slow. And then we had Russia, Ukraine. And some people predicted that, maybe. Some people didn't predict it, but the result has been massive chaos in supply chains, and that's limited the amount of availability of commodities, and that's affected demand. So we can't predict the future very well. 
And that's the one thing that you have to really remember. When people tell you how it's going to be in 2050, treat them with some caution. So here's a few examples of things we did predict to some extent. If climate change has been predicted. People were talking about climate change 100 years ago. They certainly were talking about it by the 1970s. They haven't been very good at doing anything about it, but it's not. It's been well predicted. Globalization, definitely predicted. Failure of globalization, I think, fairly well predicted. Populist politics, yes. Pandemic, people predicted the pandemic. They didn't get the year right. They didn't know exactly what it was going to look like, but people said there were plenty of people saying there will be a pandemic. And there was a pandemic. There is a pandemic. mRNA vaccines. Some people knew about that. Most people didn't, it's fair to say. Most people said it was going to take at least two years to have a vaccine for COVID, and it took a year. So incredible. Digital transformation, yeah, these things, some of these things people predicted. Here's a bunch that people really didn't predict. The growth of China. Amazing to think about it, but most people in the 1980s and 90s did not see China coming. Extraordinary. Peak oil. Peak oil has been widely predicted. It's not happened. Global financial crisis. Certainly nobody saw that coming. Again, highly predicted. Didn't see it. Social media, etc. You can read the rest of these, these things. These things people didn't see coming. We are not good at predicting the future. So remember that. When you see somebody advertise themselves as a futurist, I would run for cover. <laughs> nobody can do this. So what do we do if we can't predict the, the, predict the future? So, this is what I'm going to do now. I'm going to play a little game with you. We're in 2050. You're in a room here in 2050, and we're going to look at three scenarios. The first one's called follow the trends. The second one's the end of mining. And the third one's the mater a new materials business. So, imagine you're in the room. It's 2050. You've come to a meeting. I am a CEO. I'm a CEO of a company. Just have to get my notes here, make sure I get it right. Called Clean Mining. 2050, I run clean, clean mining, fantastic company. We've got 12 operations all over the world, some of the very best. We have an incredible reputation for innovation. We're in six different countries. We are also a leader in social practice and social development. We have social enterprises linked, linked to our operations. We're, we've won incredible awards. We're just such a cool company, you know, so we're doing great things. And our reputation for continuous improvement is second to none. We just keep doing what we're doing exactly as we've been doing it, but better. Every year, we're a little bit better and a little bit better. But I've got a board meeting today, and you wouldn't believe it. The board's upset at me. Even in spite of that record, the board's upset at me. So why is my board upset at me? Well, apparently, seven of our minds, seven of our 12, we've got community opposition. I mean, what's that about? I thought we got through that stuff back in the 30s, 2030s, but no, we've still got community opposition. You know what they're most upset about? Not enough jobs, because we've got fully automated minds we got, we're not employing anybody. They want jobs. I mean, what? <laughs> who's heard of having jobs anymore? I mean, what's that, what's, what's, that, what's, what's that all about? And then, sadly, we had a fatality at one of our mines. So all our mines, we have nobody in the mines, but somebody coming to work drove off the road, and they, and they killed themselves. I mean, people aren't allowed to kill themselves in 2050. I mean, it's, not, it's one of our policies that we don't, uh, we don't do that. So you know, what, what's that about? And then we had a leak. One of the liners in our leach pads it leaked, and some toxic acid waste got out into the, into the groundwater. I mean, these are, what's going on? These are old problems. The private equity fund refused to fund our new project because they said that our record wasn't good enough. And here I am in 2050. I joined the industry in 2022, and those were the problems back then in 2022. But the weird thing is, we still seem to have the same problems. We haven't really made any progress. We've done all this work done all this innovation. We're an incredible company. People love us, or maybe they don't. Okay? So that's your, that's your, that's your follow the trend scenario. That's the scenario. I should just give you, sorry, the slide here that will help you. Follow the trend. So we've done basically, we've gone forward for the next 27 years doing what we're doing now. We've built out to, to meet the energy transition. We've got through supply chain issues. We've dealt with ESG and so on. We've got a Climate change pressure has helped us get there, and yet we're not really any different. And that's really kind of the story of mining. You know, mining basically is the same business now that it was 100 years ago. We're still moving huge amounts of rock to get out a tiny little bit of metal. That's the follow the trend scenario. Let's try a, di try a different scenario. So this scenario is called the end of mining, and it was actually based on something the BBC did in their Future Planet series. They ran, ran this, uh, 
this little scenario called uh, how ending mining would change the world. So I had a little bit involved involvement in this. And the, the idea was that mining stops dead. Now what, what does the world look like over the following weeks, months, and years? So this, in my scenario that I'm going to just paint for you, it's a little bit different than that. I try to make it a little more realistic because you know, mining isn't going to stop dead tomorrow. So we're in the room. It's 2050. I'm, a, I'm an author. I'm writing a book about the last 30 years of mining. And looking back, one of the big events that happened in, over this period was in 2030. In 2030, there was so much opposition to mining that the UN passed a resolution to phase out mining over the next five years. Devastating news for the miners, but the world was just applauding. This is a great change we're going to get through. This is the disruptive change that we need to change the way we do things. We're going to do without a lot of metals. We're going to just be so much better, better for it. Well, things didn't work out quite so well. In the first weeks after that announcement, companies started doing layoffs because they could see what was going to happen. Obviously, they had to constrain their budgets and focus their efforts to try and restructure their whole company. So they started laying off people. In the city of Perth in Western Australia, on a Monday morning, about 30,000 people get up for work, go to the airport, and take planes to, to go to their mine sites. But with that announcement, uh, already the mines had cut back that by half. So suddenly, the, the, the airlines didn't have so much money. So the airlines were stressed. They were, started laying off people and so on. As this, as the mood started to creep through, people started to think about what, was, what, this, what this meant. And some countries who were already opposed and concerned about the ASM, artisanal mining, decided to use this as the excuse to send the military in to clear out some of the ASM, ASM mine sites. Because this was the reason they could show that they were doing their part to shut down mining. So they, this was the low-hanging fruit. They could go in and they could attack the artisanal miners. And of course, that led to conflict. So there was murder and terrible things were, be were beginning to happen. As the weeks go to months, penny starts to drop about how much we're going to miss. Manufacturing industries start curtailing their production, start laying, up, laying off workers. Communication systems start to, start to go a bit wobbly because we can't, the supply chains start to be affected and we can't get enough material. Things are getting a bit, bit antsy now. Some countries that have resources start massive stockpiling programs, big stockpiling. So they're not selling their material anymore. They're just stockpiling everything they have so they can get through this period because we don't know how long this period is, is, is going to last. And that starts to lead to conflict. Now, countries who have stockpiles are being attacked by other countries, physically attacked by countries that don't have stockpiles to try and get hold of some of that, some of the mineral. Society starts to break down. Politics starts to become incredibly com conflicted and, uh, and nasty as we try and re re you know, grapple with this. The countries, the rich countries that have the most resources do better, even better you know, proportionally than the poor countries. So inequality just becomes dramatically different. Clean up at old mine sites stops dead because no one's got the money or the resources to do any cleanup. So cleanup stops as well at, at, at old mine sites. Everything starts to fall apart. As I'm looking at this and writing about this, then I have to tell you about what happened. So about 2040, you know, it was chaos in the world. There was, nobody was traveling. Nobody was doing anything. Agriculture was starting to be affected. Food supplies were suffering. But about 2040, there were starts of some progress. See, a few things started to happen. There was incredible innovation going on. People started recovering metals from seawater. People recovered metals from brines. They were used more in situ. They put brines into the ground to leach metals. So people started producing metals again. The material revolution was rampant. Every kind of biotype processing, nature-based solution that you could think of was being used to derive new materials that could re replace some of our existing materials. Trees were being used for buildings at an incredible rate, but of course, that was constrained by the fact that the equipment to cut down the trees wasn't available because the old equipment was falling apart. And there was no metal to replace the, that, those, those equipment. So people were back to big saws, cutting down trees in order to get, make these fantastic new materials. And the world started to change. The world started to get to grips. And by last year, which was 2049, we started to see real signs that the world had adapted to the world with no mining. We were onto a, onto a new track. But inequality was still big because the countries that really had the, the wherewithal to do that research were really advancing quickly. And the many countries that didn't have that were being, again, left behind as they had, had been before. So at 2050, we arrive at a world approaching some sort of equilibrium without mining. Okay, so that's the, that's, uh, that's the world with no mining scenario. Dramatic, catastrophic, a disaster movie, you know, all of those things. Very unlikely. 
but it's a scenario designed just to make you think and provoke you to wonder about what it is that we could do were we in that, uh, were we in that situation. Okay, last one. Last one, of course, is the, I'm an optimist, so I had to finish on the good one. So, you're in a room, you'll come to a presentation from a company that my company is New Age Materials. I'm a research scientist, I work for this company, I have a background in earth science and materials. I understand how to actually turn materials in the ground into materials that, that we use. It's an incredible, New Age Metals is an incredible mining, sorry, not mining company, incredible materials company. We have three hubs, although we're largely virtual. We have 22 partner centers where we work with all sorts of other companies in order to do the kinds of, kinds of things. We have three research campuses affiliated with three incredible universities around, around the world. And we are at the forefront of designing new materials for the modern age and finding ways to make them with the minimum amount of raw material, the minimum amount of material that, that we introduce. So my, me my meeting today, I, I should tell you that my team, I have a team, I work in a team. My team, I have this earth site material, but I work with a bioengineer, a social scientist, and of course the key person on my team is an environmental psychologist, of course. <laughs> So I have an incredible team, and we're going into this meeting, and that's because we've got a new product, this incredible product. We've got a, a, a material now that can be used for making buildings that is instantly solar charging. And that's because this is materials designed because buildings in 2050, where I am now, all buildings have to produce their own energy. You cannot have a building, you cannot make a building unless you can show that it is net zero in terms of its energy demand. And so this, is one of, this material that we've got is one of these magic materials that's going to make that happen. So our raw materials that we use as this new age company, we get raw materials from recycle streams. We have a lot of different recycle streams through our partners globally. But we also produce metals from brines and other, and other liquids on the, on the planet. We do some in situ stuff. And we still actually have some mines. We have, a, we have a few mines. Our mines are all underground. There's almost no visual impact or indication of the mining process at the surface. And there's no, there's no waste, whatever. You can't see waste. Any waste that we do generate goes back, back, back underground. Our mines produce five to 15 products. We don't have any mines that just produce. I mean, back, you know, back in 2022, those mines just produced one commodity. I mean, what was that about? That's ridiculous. All our mines now produce five to 15 products. Everything we can find a use for, we turn into something at our mines, and we pride ourselves on being, being able to do that. So today, I'm going to the meeting with my, my cohort. In my cohort, I have a geoscientist, I have a material scientist, I have a designer, I have a social scientist, I have a, pers a person, a leader from an indigenous company who's one of our partners. I have uh, um, people who think about economics, business development. We have a very diverse team. They all have different backgrounds. And you know what's really cool? When we go through the door into that meeting, we have to sit and we have to, to punch in, very, answer various questions on an algorithm. And that al this algorithm determines whether or not we have any biases that are going to impact the outcome of the meeting. So we do a bias check as we come into the meeting. All of us do our bias check. You know, back in 2022, people used to do conflict of interest. They used to go into a meeting and declare whether they had a con. How ri ridiculous is that? They all had conflicts of interest, and they all said they had none. We now have an algorithm that determines whether we have any biases that are going to impact the outcome of this meeting. So we leave our biases at the door, and we come in, and we have this incredibly diverse, vibrant interaction in our meeting, and we produce wonderful, amazing products that are going to make the world even better in 20, 2000, sorry, 2100 than it is in 2050. There you go. That's my idealistic super scenario. The world with a wonderful place. And of course, all our minds are reclaimed and rehabilitation is done famously and all the legacy issues are taken care of, et cetera, et cetera. So here's a little diagram just to show my three scenarios here. The red arrow is the trends, the follow the trends. So those are the trends. The trends are positive. Many, many good things are happening in the world today around mining. The vast majority are positive, but the change is incremental. And this is our problem that we face. The change is small. We're grappling, mining companies have incredible people grappling with these problems, but we're still governed by the paradigm of moving a lot of material in order to get a small amount of metal. That's the way it is, and if we follow that trend, we'll get to a better world. There's no question by 2050, we improve. Is it good enough? That's the question we have to think hard about. We go through the no mining, go into chaos, disaster, whatever you want to do, and perhaps we emerge. That's why I drew this big circle. Some things might be better, some things might be worse. Who knows? It's a disaster movie. 
So we don't want to go there. Mining is a part, a fundamental part of our existence and has been for 10,000 years. We are not going to get away with it. We have to have it. So the question is, how do we do it better? And so my scenario three is my idealistic scenario in which we've solved these issues and we now are in a different type of business. We have a different way of working with people. We have a different way of producing the materials that we need and we're part of the economy. And do you know what? Everybody loves us. We are the coolest companies on the planet. So that's a wonderful scenario, perhaps. <coughs> just just to, to finish up, so the key when you think about the future is we can't predict it. So scenario planning, thinking of potential outcomes is a vital part of what we all need to do in terms of thinking about our future. And we, if you should run hundreds of scenarios, that's a good thing. There's a big mine in Peru that I was involved in. They run 93 scenarios for their future planning. Continuously. Now, of that 93, they're only probably working on five because a lot of them are further, way far, far out and they're not ready for them and so on. But they are thinking about 93 different scenarios of the way different resources, different potential applications, different ways to develop those resources. We all need to be thinking like this in order to, to, to understand the scenarios. So the, the, you know, the, the brief summary, I think, for me, of these three scenarios that I just ran by you is that following the trends, doing what we're doing is not sufficient. We have to do much more than do what we're doing. No mining is not going to happen. We will be mining. But the lesson from that is that there will be things that hit us, surprises, the so-called black swan events. They will happen. So if we're not ready for them, if we don't have scenarios that incorporate the things that we can't expect that are going to go wrong, we're going to get caught short and we're going to have big problems. Whether they're societal, whether they're ESG, whether they're technical, it doesn't matter. We will have chaotic events. There is no question the pandemic, if anybody didn't think chaos doesn't happen, the pandemic should be the wake-up call of the things that we're going to face in the, in, the, in the future. And then the ideal case, the lesson from the ideal case is it is idealistic, but if it's, there's nothing wrong with having an idealistic goal to strive for, something that's out there in the future, and the question we have to ask ourselves then is how could we get to that? If that's the scenario that we really want, what do we have to do now? What do we have to start thinking about what do we have to start changing now in order to eventually get to a scenario that looks something like the picture I painted in 2050? That's it. So these were done to provoke you to think about it. You've done some fantastic thinking this week already. And I'm really looking forward to your, your presentations. They're going to be amazing, I know, because they were amazing three years ago, and I have no doubt they'll be equally amazing today. And uh, this is what it's all about. What are we going to do? Thanks. <laughs>